Good day, sir. I welcome you especially to this interactive session. Thank you for honoring this session. Thank you for coming on the board. So please, can we get to know you? Uh, well, my name is um, Ladipo Lewis. I'm an architect, um, registered architect in Nigeria. I've uh, been practicing since I graduated in 1990 from the University of Jos with a BSc and MSc in architecture. I've uh, been part of the architectural family and um, spent, I'm a fellow of the Nigerian Institute of Architects. I'm an international associate member of the American Institute of Architects. And uh, I'm also affiliated to so many other architectural associations worldwide, quite the numerous ones that have attended their conferences from the Center for Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat to the International Parking Institute, ISOCAP, and uh, so, 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 uh, the ACICAD yeah, University in the UK. So I enjoyed practicing as an architect. Uh, I focused mainly on architectural designs and development of buildings, yeah. And I used to be the chairman of the Nigerian School of Architects, Lagos State chapter between 2012 and 2016. And I've been a member of so many architectural committees and boards of uh, education and uh, other other panels in the institute and in the regulatory body. Okay, you're welcome, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Us. Yes. Yes. So you carried out a research yes. on architectural education. There has been yes. this controversy, this lingering controversy between those that studied in the polytechnic and those that studied architecture in the university. So from your research, can you please enlighten us on the on architectural education in Nigeria? and also the roles of each segment, likewise the vision of NYC, just as your research has okay. established. Okay, I would like to start with um, the history of architecture, then I'll focus on Nigeria because you, you have to start at the beginning. Originally, you know, the architecture was like the word architecton, the master builder. So like every other profession, people learned from being uh, tutored by more senior people. Yeah. So you learned by practice. And the earliest architects really didn't go to universities. They learned on the masters. And you had the kind of a guild thing where you practice and then after some years, you qualified to be able to go on your own. But then uh, like two centuries ago, the practice of setting up schools of architecture came up. Then also the regulation of the practice also came into place where you're now required to have a license given by the state. So you, you, you have an education and then you have a licensure process and then you are qualified to call yourself an architect. That's basically what we um, kind of acquired in Nigeria to practice architecture. So you had uh, first, the Association of Architects, that is like any association of architects like the NIA. Then you had the regulatory body, the Architects Association Council of Nigeria, regulating it. And then you had the requirement that you had to have certain qualifications deemed uh, necessary by the regulatory body and the laws of Nigeria. Because the regulatory agency is set up by government. So it's like a law permitting you, you know, you know, that sets up that agency that regulates you and checks that you are qualified to practice for public safety. That's it. So it's basically to protect the public. So most countries, or practically every country that I know of, has a regulatory body and a requirement to get licensed. So you have also a union of international architects that's the UIA, International Union of Architects. So if you go into there, which all countries, most countries are, are members of, there's a requirement for 
the qualification for architects. It's expected that you do a minimum five-year university degree program. Mm -hmm. And then you do a minimum of two years, in some countries, three years of tutelage under a professional practice an and an architect. And then you are qualified to sit for an exam. On passing this exam, you're then given a license by the reg regulatory body in that country. So that's universally accepted now. Okay. So if you go to a lot of countries, there's always a seal for the architect. Now that seal is not to protect the architect, but to protect the public. No. So <laughs> yes, it's to protect the public. Just like if you say you're giving a driver's license, it's really not to protect the driver, but the passengers and the pedestrians on the road. If you're giving a pilot's license, it's not to protect the pilot. It does protect the pilot, but primarily it's to protect the passengers. So every other license, a NAFTAC license on any label, is actually not to protect the manufacturer of the food product that you consume, but the consumers, the public. So that's another aspect of architectural regulation that we also need to understand. Now, in moving along to how the architectural body was set up, the requirement was that you had to have a five-year degree program. Uh, there's always this misconception that uh, the early architects had diplomas from the UK you know, and from, from Europe. But those diplomas were five-year programs, They're actually degree program, programs. Yeah. Now, in the UK, the polytechnics have been scrapped and converted to universities since the 90s. Yes, yeah, so they're all universities now. And then the structure in the UK is a bit complex. So before I come to Nigeria, so we understand, you know, sometimes in architecture, you do case studies, isn't it? Yeah. You do research. <laughs> yes, to understand things that have happened before you, experiences and knowledge. And then you can take decisions based on those all the experiences and knowledge. So you'll make the mistakes. In the UK, you have the regulatory body called the ARB. Yes. Then you have the associations. You have the RIB, you have the Scottish Institute of Architects, you have the Welsh Institute of Architects, you have the Irish Institute of Architects. Uh, you have also the some other smaller associations like Manchester Institute of Architects and so many others. Uh, now, that is the association, but you have just one regulatory body set up by government. Unfortunately, in the UK, they don't require you to have a license to practice. Mm. That's the truth. Only the title is regulated, unfortunately. Mm. Now, most architects will say they don't accept that, that the practice should be regulated. But the title is regulated, and they are very strict about the title. You cannot call yourself an architect in the UK if you're not registered by the ARB. And you could be fined as much as $2,500 if you did in one instant. So, and you could be fined in 10 instances in the UK. They are quite strict about it. But people could produce drawings and submit them for approval if they meet the requirements. You, there is no seal for the architect in the UK. Mm -hmm. But if you cross over to the US or Canada, there's a requirement of a seal, and you go to jail if you produce a drawing that requires an architect stamp on it, and you're not an architect. Same thing in the European Union. So I found out that UK is probably the only country I know of where it's only the title that is protected. Mm -hmm. Now, in the UK, they also have an architectural technology card, uh, profession mm -hmm. side by side with the architects. So if you read architectural technology, you could join uh, this, the Chartered Institute of Architectural Technologists. Yeah, you get it. But you cannot join ARB or even RIBA. Yeah. Well, they, they said the technology degree allows you to look at the technical aspect of architecture. And they basically focus on small buildings and residential buildings why the architects focus on the large buildings. In some countries, they will tell you that, oh, they focus on more of the technology of how buildings are put together. So they work with architects who design the buildings and then the technologist looks at the details in it. Now I'm going to come to that as relating to Nigeria. 
So in Nigeria, what we noticed is that we had university degrees, and then you had the polytechnics where architectural technology was now introduced into it with a two-year national diploma and another two-year higher national diploma. And then over the years, we found out that people wanted to convert from reading architectural technology to becoming architects. But what is architectural technology? And what was the vision of those who set it up in the polytechnic? Now, if you go to the polytechnics, you will see that there are workshops and laboratories, and they're looking at the technology. And the idea of the polytechnic was to create a technological cadre for Nigeria. People who were hands-on producing things with their hands or had the knowledge to understand a design. So you had them as technologists and technicians. And the focus was, how do we develop Nigeria if we don't have technologists? How do we develop our industrial base if we do not have the skill sets required? So an architect could design a building. A technologist will come in to put in the components. Now, there are a lot of parts of our architecture that is technology, but we don't know the difference. Now, an architect who does aluminum cladding, and there are quite a lot of them, is actually doing technology. That's the technology of, in architecture. Mm -hmm. An architect who is producing doors, and I know quite a few who produce doors, is actually practicing architecture technology. An architect who goes into roofing, there are quite a few of them, is actually practicing architectural technology. Aluminum components, interior finishing, that's the technology of architecture. How do the things come together? Now we have a huge opportunity. If you look at the technological market of architecture in Nigeria, when you buy your building materials, they're not sold, they are not marketed, they are not produced by professionals. They're produced by lay people. So if you go to the market, you will see doors of all kinds. Nobody looks at them. Nobody certifies them. Nobody knows the specs, you know, of those doors, the standards required for those doors. And it's quite sad because that's the role architectural technology were meant to play. The, the schools of architectural technology were meant to train people with hands-on knowledge. So if I designed a house with a beautiful POP ceiling and I put all the dimensions and details of how I want it to look like, the technology is going to come in to break it down into its components and say, look, oh, you need this type of a gypsum board. It has to be 12 mm thick. It has to be 8 mm thick. Uh, you're going to use steel struts. They need to be this size because of the weight, because of the span and all that, and do those calculations. And then look at the edge trims. Are they plastic edge trims? Are they metal edge trims? Depending on the environment, mm -hmm. what quality of finish will be required to achieve this? So he does the workshop drawings. So there's a level of detail. Now, architectural technologies in most countries were meant to work with practically everybody. So if you had a door manufacturing company, you'd have an architectural technologist breaking down your drawings, your workshop drawings for those doors into its details. If you had a manufacturer of locks and keys, you have an architectural technologist who will be, who'll be working with you to do all those drawings, those detailed drawings of the doors, the hinges, uh, all the accessories you know, required in doors. If you had an aluminum uh, windows and doors manufacturing company, you would require an architectural technologist to do the workshop drawings. It's quite sad today that if you were buying or fixing aluminum doors and windows in your house, you would probably not get workshop drawings from them. True. It's very, very rare because they don't have the architectural technologies working with them. Or they don't even have architectural you know, leading those companies, being able to bring in that technology, you know, that skill set, that, that skill set into that business. And you have a lot of other aspects of uh, the building industry that requires architectural technologies. I personally would want to see a detail of a bathroom, how the tile is going to be fixed against the floor drain, uh, against required waterproofing, against the sliding glass 
uh, cabinet door for the for the for the bathroom. Those details, waterproofing details, roof details, you know, uh, ceiling details. These require intense amount of workshop drawings. So we need the trained technological cadre to be able to do this. Unfortunately, most people don't see the requirement. So some most of the time when you see uh, working drawings, they are bereft of the workshop drawings. Mm. Now let's even go to the area of kitchen cabinets. People would install kitchen cabinets without drawings. They simply show you a brochure of what it looks like. Mm. And then when it comes to actually fixing it, you not see the problems. Certain things don't just fit because there are no workshop drawings. Yeah. And then there's a, a, a lot of mismatch. You know, you can't even buy some of these things with basic workshop drawings because we do not have the technical cadre. So there's a large industry and a large pool of uh, resources required to bring about a change in an architectural ed education and our mindset. Um, I did a, I did, I was invited to be part of a panel to a polytechnic in the North mm -hmm. by the Ministry of Education. And I was probably the youngest person in that panel. And uh, it was led by a 70 year professor of chemistry, you know, from the North. And he was educating us about the polytechnic uh, system of education and university system of education. Then there were two parallel lines. They were meant, meant to converge or transfer one to the other, except they want to take to change careers. And he said the technological cadre was supposed to get to the peak of their capacity by whatever means they, 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 they required without having to change lanes. And that technology was different from the university education. One of the most important things we need to look at is the, uh, the, the industrial base that this could create for Nigeria. We look at doors now. We basically import a lot of our doors, especially the security doors from Israel, from Turkey, from China. Meanwhile, we could have people who were trained to design these doors and also produce them. We have the bank of industry that's supposed to in, you know, invest in small scale industries. We're supposed to develop uh, industrial parks. But we also need the trained people who could design these things. And there's so many things that we could also, you know, architectural technologies could design for the building industry. So that would have been the role for the architectural technologies. And, you know, it's you know, a great opportunity. The sad part is that a lot of architects actually do construction and practice architectural technology yes. as they are bread and butter. <laughs> you know, sir, they, um, yes. they usually say that they are also taught the same way you are being taught in university. I mean, the, yeah. those that went to different techniques, they said it's yeah. almost the same thing. So why then are they <laughs> in this field? Well, that's an argument that some people might make. But if you if you bring the curriculum together, there are a lot of disparities. You spend four academic years, your national diploma and your higher national diploma. The BSc MSc program is a six-year program. So you can't compare four years to six years. You know, that's a marked difference. The curriculum is different. Yes, you can be taught to design. Even the draftsmen are taught to do rudimentary drafting and designs and all that, but not to, to great depth as you would in the university. The lecturers you have in university are different from the ones you have in the polytechnic. You know, in the university, you, you, your lecturers have to have a PhD. They don't go beyond a certain point if they don't. Uh, there are requirements, theoretical requirements, and a number of hours for certain courses in the universities that you don't have in the polytechnics. So we, we need to be careful about saying it's the same thing being said by the person who is the recipient, <laughs> mm -hmm. rather than you know, an independent person looking at both of them and placing them together. You know, if you take history of architecture, the number of man hours you would spend university, or course hours, as they say in university, yeah, you'd spend, it's different from that of the polytechnic and so many other aspects. And in the first place, the polytechnic was supposed to focus on technology. 
You're supposed to spend time in the workshops and in laboratories, and they are well equipped. The polytechnic I went to was so well equipped that I saw equipment I'd never seen before. You know, and uh, the government had spent billions of naira equipping these workshops. So if you wanted to break down a car, you could in the polytechnic. They had all these things. So you can imagine if we focused on that and we brought our technological educational system to the level where it would impact on national development, we will achieve a lot. And a lot of people who actually are in the profession of architecture find out a lot of them are doing archite practice architecture technology on the side. And the truth is this, we cannot do without architecture technologists. And the idea is to for our people to move into those areas where we could impact the development of buildings. We keep on saying our standards and quality of buildings are dropping. We are building collapse and all these things. You know, architecture technologies taking their role in the industry will affect the final output of our buildings and the built environment as a whole. We can't do it that way. It's something we cannot do without. That's the thing. We have to have that uh, niche created and we have to have it filled. And uh, we can't continue importing everything when we could have people who could produce it here in Nigeria and we could fund the production. That's the truth. You know, let's be sincere with ourselves. A lot of architects will talk about, oh, I don't do consultancy. A clients don't pay fees, but they pay for the construction. Isn't that the reality that most people would claim? So uh, it's, 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 it's also like, um, you know, we are not really facing the facts. The opportunity is there for us to, you know, grow along a certain line. We also have to reorient our thinking, the perception that this is the only way to succeed and you need to go, do, go this way to succeed. Meanwhile, there, there are other opportunities there. The market for building products is huge, is massive. You only need to go to the ports and see the number of containers containing architectural components coming into the country on a daily basis. And then look at you know, what we could you know, achieve by developing our capacity. But it's a choice. That's the truth. It's a choice. I had a, a, a friend who read BSMS architecture. And at the end of the day, he said he wasn't, he didn't want to become an architect. He went into the manufacturing of doors. And he's doing quite well manufacturing doors. As way back as 2014, he sold a door for 3 million naira. One single door for 3 million naira. In the realm of consultancy today, <laughs> 3 million naira is a lot of money to, for a drawing. <laughs> That's what the people will tell you. <laughs> so, and he can set his price for whatever he's producing. That's the truth. So I believe that we we also we need to look at that. It's it's something that over time is going to affect us because as technology improves, a lot of our architectural designs are going to require a lot of you know detailing. Some components are going to be manufactured in factories. If we are left out of that value chain, we're going to have problems. We're going to left out be left out of the industry that makes the money. That's the truth. And a huge quantum of what we use is imported up to now. It's true. Yeah. Even uh, the, the fixing of the things we have, if you go and check when you're buying components for fixing, the people who are selling to you did not read architecture. The, you find out they're basically marketers. Yeah. So you look at it that the person who's marketing to you is not actually trained or with, at, with the capacity to deliver some of the things you want. Sometimes we ask them some questions and they're like, well, this is what we have. You know, we don't really have detailed specifications. But when a trained person is looking at a building component, he knows what to ask for. He knows the questions to, to, to ask the manufacturer. 
And then when he is specifying it, he's giving it to you with the capacity of knowledge that he has. So I believe it's something that we need to look at. It's something that we need to push. And it's also we need to also reorient our thinking as to the difference between architectural technology and architectural design. And that's the truth. There, there is a marked difference. <laughs> you know. But then, sir, so since you are a member of the Institute and also a one-time practice chairman, this is yeah. a question coming from one of the persons that sent in their questions. He said, yeah. good day. The Nigerian Institute of Architects has pushed us, mostly the technologists, into the field, which is basically the engineering chores although we are bound to have certain level of knowledge and understanding of the field work, please, it's good they remove architecture course from diploma in Nigeria. <laughs> you, see, I, I, you see, well, I, I appreciate his question, but obviously he has not, I would I say, envisioned the possibilities of having read architectural technology. The capacity for, yeah. The yeah. capacity for him now to excel mm -hmm. in that industry is there. Now, let me give an example. Imagine you trying to design. Uh, I asked somebody. We asked somebody to produce kitchen. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, a bathroom cabinet for us, mm -hmm. and the client was ready to pay about almost one point eight million for it. He couldn't do the workshop drawings. He couldn't do the detailed drawings. We ended up with something we did not like. Because, yeah, person didn't have the capacity to, to interpret the architectural drawings. So the, the contractor and he himself had to repeat the job twice. And a lot of materials were wasted. So those are opportunities. Imagine you wanted to do a, a sophisticated POPC, like you could see the detailed drawings. You could be corrected. A lot of wastage, you know, would have, have been avoided. And, and the, the, the design will come out the way you wanted it to be. So you can have a very good rendering, have very good drawings with detailed dimensions. But when it comes to coupling them together, putting them together, you need the technological training, which is not there currently yeah. so when you ask someone to fix some things together it's left to the libra the uh the tyler the carpenter to do those things and of course there are limitations so we need to first start with reorienting our minds then giving the right kind of training and also the right kind of support and partnership to anyone who reads architectural technology because if you read architectural technology, you also need to be able to understand drawings. True. Yeah, because that's the basis. So you need to know how drawings are put together. You need to know the different wall elements and components. Uh, sorry, the building elements and components, what the wall is, what the ceiling is. So when an architect does a drawing, you should be able to interpret it. And then when we look at architectural design, it goes beyond just drawing lines. The process of architectural design has steps. You know, they are supposed to be like seven stages to eight stages now. If you really want to follow the stage, there's a lot of documentation involved. So much documentation that you would need to seed the detailing to someone else, the workshop drawings to someone else mm -hmm. as an architect, because there's so much you're going to manage. Because you're not just going to manage your architectural drawings, you're going to manage the synergy between your architectural drawings, the structural drawings with the mechanical electrical drawings, with other you know, services drawings. You're going to match that with taking the detailed drawings, the workshop drawings, and seeing that they fit with your architectural drawings. And there's so much you can do within the time frame to deliver a building. So there is room for specialization. And there is enough for everybody. In fact, looking at it, the architectural challenges will make more money than the architect on a project. Because yes, he could he will install so many things. His charges are going to be based on the contract price, you know, mm -hmm. and the materials he brings to the project. So, and if we don't have those people, what we get are laymen. You know, somebody is installing a door to you, read English. 
he's not going to be able to put up drawings. So when you design a door, and see this is how I want it to look at, the technical complexities of putting it together is going to be beyond him. The finishes are going to be beyond him. We've had a case where somebody was importing doors. Yes, he showed us the brochures and everything, but what he brought in was totally different from what we were expecting. And that's because he couldn't recognize that what he had been giving was different. You know, okay. or you've had a case of the client who went abroad to buy doors for a, a project that was 24 flats. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can imagine each flat probably has about 12 or more doors. Mm -hmm. And he brought only doors swinging in one direction for the entire building. <laughs> because you have to have left swing doors, you have to write right swing doors and all that. He bought only one set because that's what he knew. It was a disaster. <laughs> so when you have people who specialize in these things, they're able to tell you that, oh, this door is suitable for this area. This door is not suitable for this area. Yeah. You know, you as an architect can talk about what you 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 expect, but the actual practical thing, somebody who's a specialist has to do it. Yeah. Although, sir, from this question, yeah. you will understand yeah. that the person already understands the technological aspect of what he is doing, yeah. but then I think he is not seeing the when I say the potential in it. Yeah, yes. Which is yeah, he's not seeing the global picture. He's not seeing the large picture in it. And that, that's another thing we need to start inculcating into the profession. Even for the young architect who's even in university, someone, someone, a student architect, they also need to see the global picture, what architecture is all about. You know, there's different perceptions. Some believe architecture is on site, you know, that the work of the architect is on site. Meanwhile, <laughs> a huge percentage of the architect's work is actually in the office. You know, I, I was interviewing a young man who is just finishing in university. And I said, has he seen code compliance drawings? I said, no, he doesn't know what that is. Now, in other countries, it's a requirement. You need to do a code analysis of your building that it meets safety requirements. Mm -hmm. Now, if we're going to start putting details like that, if you're going to start doing an analysis for ventilation, analysis for lighting, you're, you're calculating occupancy. Mm -hmm. You're doing, you know, a lot of um, analysis on even viability, financial viability. There's a lot the architect needs to deal with. And you need to specialize. You now have architects, you know, who specialize in uh, health care architecture, lies in industrial architecture. Some specialize in high-rise buildings. To get more sophisticated, we're going to require everybody to specialize in particular and then work together as a team in the architectural profession. So, and I'll say this everybody thinks a paper qualification is all that you need. So, that drive that, oh, I want this thing, I want to be called this, I want to be that. Well, it's good, but it can only carry you so far in the industry. Okay, then I also ask yes. another person asks, I have a HND yes. in yes. architecture. I'm resuming NYS this year. Yes. I would want to know if I can write professional exams with my HND. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> well, from what I know currently, yeah. it's not possible. And uh, the requirement is that because what you have the, with the HND, it is, it is a higher national diploma. Is actually in architectural technology. That's what the curriculum says. Your curriculum is done by the National Board for Technical Education, which is different from Nigerian University's Commission, NUC. So NUC is different from MBTE. Mm -hmm. So you can't jump from one to the other. <laughs> so he if currently I hear what is required is that he would have to. Uh, do some years in the university and get the required accredited degree and then do the two years tutelage, minimum two years before he can sit for the professional exam. He already has a qualification that can take him places. 
with a higher national diploma. I, I believe that you know what he should be looking at is the knowledge I have, how do I apply it? I asked, I, I met a young man and I said, look, I see a lot of people doing POP ceilings, but they can't do drawings. Yes, they'll show you pictures, but they can't do the drawings, detailed drawings. So if you give them a space, they're just going to show you the picture that this is how we're going to do it. You don't know what you're going to get at the end of the day. So imagine someone who specializes and could come in and give you the technical drawings and give you the... 3D visualization of what you're going to get. And you are sure that, oh, what I'm paying for is what I'm going to get at the end of the day. That opportunity is there. And it affects every other thing. You know, a lot of the tradesmen are making a lot of money off the clients without even having the requisite technical knowledge. And they're getting away with it. And sometimes they do a lot of, and they run away. You know that happens. You know that's the issue of regulation. The fact that if you're regulated, you are bound to deliver and you cannot renege on whatever agreement you've made. Mm -hmm. So imagine if the architecture technology profession had some form of regulation, the public is protected. We know how many clients pay two, three, four times for the same job because mm -hmm. the tradesman on their quotes, oh, I can do it. He collects the money and simply just not halfway through the job he can't deliver. He's either asking for more money or he abandons the work. So it's 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 something that we need to actually look at together. And I believe that until all of us in the architectural family sit down and look at these issues together and educate each other, because we need to educate each other. You know, knowledge uh, is called the acquisition of facts. Yeah. Understanding is its proper arrangement. Wisdom is his application. If you don't go through that process, you're going to be misguided about a lot of things. And you probably will not see the real picture and the opportunities available for you. Uh, I know that um, Central Bank has what they call a SMIDAN uh, program, Small Medium Enterprise uh, Development Program. And what they do is that they make it easy for you to get a loan or facility. And I think, I think the first... It ranges from between eight and 50 million. So imagine if we had that opportunity for architectural technology, you wanted to specialize in technology. So mm -hmm. you wanted to specialize in doing POP and this loan will afford you the money to buy all the equipment. And you, do you know that the kind of equipment required to do efficient gypsum ceilings, gypsum wall board fittings and things like that, are immense. We don't, people don't have those equipment to get these things done accurately. Laser levels, you know, the right kind of, you know, um, tools, cutting tools and all that. If you want to specialize in tiling, there's a lot of equipment required for tiling, which those, those facilities could sponsor. If you wanted to go into aluminum uh, uh, window or cladding, you could now buy all those laser cutting equipment and things like that. So the industry, for the technologies will be created and give us opportunity to you know create a, a better built environment we'll get better quality work done in our buildings than we currently are getting you know probably if you worked on a project you discover that the people you're dealing with are a lot of them are illiterates <laughs> when it comes to tiling when it comes to producing doors fitting doors and things and they seem not to be able to you can't seem to communicate with them Sure. And you don't deal with them on a daily basis to be able to train them. <laughs> so that bridge that we've left for so many years yeah. abandoned is necessary. You know, it's very, very necessary. If you, if, so, so you, you, you as an architect seem to spend more time trying to get your buildings to look like what you put in, the, in your, your drawings than you ought to. Because that middle cadre of uh, would I say that interface between you and the tradesmen is not there? You know. So, sir, from, Sorry, yeah. from what you've said so far, I can say I, I can deduce that you've literally explained how one with a with an architectural technology degree can leverage yeah. that profession yeah. without feeling he or she has wasted 
um, four or five years or yeah. four years in yeah. Polytechnic. Yes. Okay. Then, sir, coming over to the professional bodies, how will they educate people that are coming into the Polytechnic? Because it seems that most persons didn't have idea of what they were to expect when they enter into the Polytechnic from the questions that have come so far. It seems they didn't have an idea. How would the professional body come in? And also the points that you've mentioned, how will the government, the professional body also come in to remedy these issues? Well, I would have to say this from my own personal experience. Okay. When I took JAM for the first time in 1983, I saw it in the JAM form that you required a BS and MSc to become a registered architect. It was there in the jam form, I, you know, as at that time. And so what I, when I read that, I did not get into the university that year because of the cutoff mark for university I applied for. And my parents asked me to go to the Polytechnic, Yaba College of Technology at that time. I said, no, that I need a DSC, an MSc to become a registered architect. I was a sister. I was probably about uh, 15 years old then. So I insisted. So I decided I would go to A-levels and then sit for jam again that I need to go to university. Mm -hmm. So some of us had an idea of what was required. A lot of people did not. In fact, most people assumed it was the same thing. You know? Yeah. And let's be truthful to ourselves. A lot of people had applied for university, couldn't get into university, and then went to the polytechnic. Because the, the universities were very competitive, especially for architecture. There were limited spaces. So that is always a defining requirement of entry into the university or the polytechnic. Now, going beyond that, the associations and the bodies are supposed to be the advocates and the, the let me say, the guidance counselors. So from the 100 level of the first year of the polytechnic year, they need you need to do an orientation as to how your career is expected to progress as to how you're going to move, how your, even your academic qualifications, the courses you're not supposed to take seriously and how at the end of the day, you are going to develop your career. So what I'm looking at is that we need to do a lot of advocacy. There has to be a lot of reaching out to the student, the candidates or the students in the, in the polytechnic and university. Even some university students really do, are not planning to be architects. I know one who at 300 level had made, said he was, after his BSc, he's going into the film industry. He was already shooting videos already, you know, and said, look, yes, he had videos on YouTube that he had produced of uh, musical videos, and they were very good quality. And I said, after his BSc, he was going somewhere else. It's not, there's nothing wrong in that. That is vision, and he would do well there, probably even better than an architect. I'm sure you've heard of MGM, the MGM Resorts. Mm -hmm. They own MGM movies, they own hotels in Las Vegas. The chairman of the company at one, or the manager director of the company at one time, actually had a BS in architecture before he fired out into finance. <laughs> and there are a lot of people who had first degrees in architecture before going on to other things. So of course the opportunity is there, but if you really want to practice based on the knowledge you've acquired, then you need to know which direction to take. So a lot of advocacy has to be done. Uh, in Nigeria, we don't have the booklets or the manuals. Why do you want to become an architect? What does it take to become an architect? I think someone like you should produce those books <laughs> and put them online. Yes. What does it take to become an architect? If you go, if you Google that online, you probably get a lot of material in the UK yes. and in the US on that. Yes. And so someone coming in at the initial stage would actually educate himself and decide, is this thing meant for me or is it not meant for me? You know? So that's what we need, the advocacy. Yeah. Okay. And it has to be done by people like you and I. Sure. Yes. Thank you, sir, for that um, response to that question. Yes. Then, sir, yes. you mentioned something about the vision of NYSC. I don't know if you could throw yes. a little light on that. Yes. Yes, in the 60s and 70s, and even up to the 80s, uh, 
the United States government created what they call the Peace Corps. Now, they would pick graduates from various fields and send them to third world countries. And they were meant to just assist. So a lot of them even came to secondary schools to teach. And uh, they had an impact on our educational system. Some went to work on farms, some went to work in rural areas. They were just like ambassadors, you know, from the US to us. Now the NYC was supposed to be, you call it National Youth Service Corps. It's a national youth service. And it was done to unify Nigeria. So if you schooled in one part of the country, you are sent to another part of the country, you know? And the idea was that, look, you are there to serve the nation, not yourself. That's the truth. So wherever you were sent, you were supposed to make an impact. It wasn't your, I don't think the primary thing was your university education that they were looking at. It was you as the person going to make a social economic impact wherever you are sent. And it gave people the opportunity to go to places they had never been to. I know someone who, as a medical student, was sent to my degree. And he stayed back there and built one of the largest private hospitals. And he was from Delta State. Yes. And people were sent from all kinds of places. So I felt that, look, my thinking was, look, it's a national youth service. If I was sent to a village as an architect, I could teach in the school. I could inspire the students to become teachers. Maybe that's the only opportunity that one year. It was a sacrificial one year. That, that's what it was meant to be. So I could impact those students in developing them. It wasn't a, a, an opportunity for me to develop myself, being paid by government. And you see a lot of people, that they, they don't even want to leave the NYC after the first year. They want to continue to collect the allowance. <laughs> and we've seen that trend now happening. <laughs> you, you get it? After finishing NYC, they want to stay back and continue to become a copper because of the allowance they're getting. So the whole vision has been misconstrued. Now people want to select where they are posted to. Yes, I can agree about insecurity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the terrorism occurring in certain areas that people are scared of going to. But then there are also areas where you could still, you are safe and you could still, you know, have an impact on the community. I can imagine I was sent to um, on those states then. And I can imagine if I had the opportunity then to work somewhere where I could have such an impact. The orientation to go for NYC also needs to be done. People are just posted without any orientation. So you don't see it as an opportunity to have an impact. You know, send a group of engineers and students to a village. They could look at the river system and say, oh, we can create a dam for this community. You get it? We can do roads for this community using self-help. And some people actually did things like that, if I remember then. Some people, you know, built roundabouts. Some people did beautification. You can imagine a school that exists without drawings. And use an architect, you sent there. Okay, you're teaching geography. You're teaching this. But you decide to do a master plan for the school as your national youth service contribution. So somehow you put an impact in that environment. And you've inspired people. Yeah. How about as a graduate architect or as that someone with a degree in architecture going to serve the country? Yeah, he's going to serve the country. You know, in some other countries, it's actually military training you do. If you are if you are in Israel or you're in Singapore or Hong Kong, it's actually that year, it's it's not even one year, it's sometimes three, four, five years. It's military training. It has nothing to do with your qualifications. You are there to protect the country. So it's a service to the country. That's the what the motivation originally. But that's not what we're getting today. So I, I, I believe, I don't know whether that would help unify Nigeria when we go back to what it was originally. That that one year you expected to Same. donate to the government or donate to the Nigerian people as your service to them. So it didn't matter where you are posted to. Because a lot of people are saying, oh, now... If I'm an engineer, I must be posted to an engineering firm. If I'm an architect, I must be posted to an architectural firm. Exactly. I feel I believe it defeats 
the aim. Goal. You might as well just scrap the the, 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 the NYC. Yeah, might as well just scrap because it doesn't have any meaning anymore. And if I can I, I can manipulate where I'm being posted to, really, you it's lost its essence. The idea was move people around and we unify Nigeria. I, I, I would like to say that the aim of Nigeria was that we were one country. Yeah. But looking at things today, we are still not one country. <laughs> and everything done to make us one country is not there. Being defeated. Yeah, it's being defeated. If you look at the Nigerian army, the Nigerian police, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's made up of people from different areas. And if you look at people who are children of military officers, they tend to speak multiple languages because they are moved from one station to the other. I've seen a few of them like that. I know someone who lived in various barracks across Nigeria and can speak at least three or four languages. Wow. And, you know, they have a better understanding of cultures from various areas. And I think that was the motivation behind the National Youth Service Corps. But that's changed now. And I think it's going to take a look. I don't know whether it's it's worth it anymore. <laughs> uh, it's still worth it. But, okay, so in yeah. one minute, yes. what would be your advice to upcoming architects, to aspiring architects, both people with um, university degree and technology in architecture? Well, my advice is that you acquire as much knowledge as you can. The truth is that an architect continues to learn every day, continues to research every day. I will give you this example. Every architectural firm I've been to all over the world has always had a library. And some of them actually have librarians employed as a member of staff. Wow. So you have some offices that I went to, uh, that, I was, that I visited, that have huge library of books and database. And I heard one architect say he has over 32,000 volumes of books in his office library. And they have librarians. So most of these firms research and have make, you know, invest in knowledge. So the young architect, the young student needs to invest in knowledge. That capacity building is what you require to create innovative buildings and also keep yourself out of trouble. You know, Nigeria is one of the very few countries where the architect makes a mistake and nobody holds him accountable for it. Unlike in the UK or in the US. My friend in Vienna said, in 12 years of practice, he has been sued 11 times by the client. So he says everything, every step he takes, he has to be very, very careful. We still have that freedom in Nigeria. But I always tell people, uh, <laughs> time might catch up with us. So my advice is gain as much knowledge as you can. You know, develop yourself. Our level of production is still low compared to what you would have in other places. I I don't know whether you have seen the American regulatory body exam mm -hmm. by the NCAP. Have you seen the curriculum? No, I'm not. In just a few seconds, let me tell you, they write six papers. Some of the, the 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 papers last for between two and a half hours to four and a half hours. They give you five years to pass it. Though they're changing that now, that it's going to be a rolling clock. You know, so you can imagine a paper that lasts between two and a half hours to four and a half hours, and you have six written papers. You actually do working drawings inside the exam. You do specifications inside the exam. You do detailing. You do site planning. You do feasibility studies. Wow. Inside the exam. <laughs> yes. So imagine somebody competing against you in a project and what he will deliver. So is that knowledge we need to acquire to be able to be competitive and to excel? Thank you so much, sir. I'm sincerely grateful for this. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you for responding to the yes. questions. Thank, Thank you. you for Thank giving you. us, revealing so many things in architecture for us. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. So to wrap up this video session, do you have any questions bothering you about the NIA, ACORN, architecture and architectural practice in general in Nigeria? I'll leave a link 
in the description of this video so as to enable you to ask your questions. Don't forget to subscribe so that you get notified when the questions have been answered by architects and when I upload the next video. And finally, share this video to your friends so that more people can be informed and send in their questions. We can all learn from one another. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching. I hope this was informative. Thank you. See you next time.